Okay, good evening uh, and welcome to General Council of June 8th. I first would like to begin uh, with any identification of any media on the line. Corey Gray, Turtle Island News. Good evening, uh, Victoria. It was nice to finally put a face to Victoria Gray last week. It was nice to meet you in person, Victoria. Uh, is there any other on the line? Okay, seeing or hearing none, uh, well, thank you again to Amber Squire for providing our opening address. We'll now move right into any changes, additions, or deletions uh, to the agenda. Yeah. Seeing or hearing none, then can I get a motion to adopt the, gen the general council agenda of June 8th, moved by Audrey, second by Michelle. Any further questions or comments? Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motions carried. Okay, that leads us right into our delegation and presentation portion of the agenda. We do have three uh, presentations this evening. Uh, the first presentation is going to begin with Dr. Bernie, Bernice Downey of McMaster University of the Indigenous Health Learning Lodge. Uh, primarily meant for information sharing and feedback on community engagement. Uh, with that being said, I'd just like to welcome you, Dr. Bernice, uh, to our General Council me meeting, uh, and we'll pass the floor right over to yourself for your presentation. Yeah, and miigwech. Um, I would like to share my screen now, if possible. And just, uh, if that's not already set up, I just want to extend my thanks um, now to the opening prayer, the beautiful um, pictorial display. I've not seen that before and I love that. Um, and also to the general council for um, um, allowing us some time on your agenda this evening. Um, shall I go ahead and share my screen then? Okay. Uh, Yes, Bernice, you should have access. Oh, there you go. Yeah, there we go. Um, so just before we begin the, um, the actual presentation, I'm not going to go through every word on these slides, um, but I just wanted to um, uh, introduce myself more formally and also share a short story to you. So uh, Bernice Downey, Nidish Dijin Nagas. Um, I've also been given the name of Niganakwe, which means head woman. I'm of Ojibwe Soto background. My people are from Lake St. Martin, Manitoba. And um, my mother grew up also in Dauphin River, Manitoba. Um, my lived experience is uh, here in Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe territory. I grew up for, um, since about the age of nine in Hamilton, Ontario. And uh, my education was in Hamilton. And um, I went further to nursing um, and took uh, my initial training in, uh, at Sheridan College in Mississauga. I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, and uh, currently I'm the Associate Dean Indigenous Health at McMaster University in the Faculty of Health Science. And um, the short story I wanna tell you as it relates to this presentation is that I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do uh, when I left high school. And I approached my mother, who I always honor, Evelyn uh, Desjardins, uh, Downey McLaren. Uh, she is uh, 92 and in McCassa Lodge in Hamilton and with advanced dementia. But when I asked her that question, she said to me, be a nurse. Uh, if you become a nurse, you will always have a job you will travel and people will respect you. And I thought, okay, that's what I'll do. And she was right on all three counts. Um, the reason why she advised me that was because she wanted to be a nurse because she saw the need in her community. Um, she saw non-Indigenous people coming to the health center. She knew that there was a need in our communities, um, but she was not privileged uh, to that um, opportunity. Uh, was a time when there was a lot of racism in cities and there was you know, no pathways to learning uh, for Indigenous students. So that's what she hoped to see in me and that's what I did. I have a long career in nursing. I worked in the local um, area of uh, Hamilton Health Sciences, 
Um, I went to Ottawa and worked at the national level. I worked with um, addictions and a mental health program initially, and then I was recruited as the executive director of the Indigenous Nurses Association, and then the chief executive officer of the National Aboriginal Health Organization. And during those experiences, what came to me the most is that we there was a disconnect between. I'm not. Is that my feedback? My apologies. If I could just request everybody who is not speaking, uh, if you could please uh, put yourselves on mute as we are receiving some feedback. So if you are not speaking, please you put yourself on mute. Okay, I thought it was me. Um, so during those experiences, um, it, it became apparent to me that there was um, a disconnect between the services and programs that the government was providing for our people. And I determined to go back to graduate school and specifically look at harmonizing health services and um, health literacy for our people. Because my question was, if we had our language and if we had our, our teachings, would we be, um, would our literacy around health, would our empowerment around health improve? But when I came to McMaster, because I wanted to be here close to my mom, um, there was nothing in the Faculty of Health Science for me. There was a student's program to support students as they were coming in, but there was no faculty who I could ask to be my supervisor. And so somebody put me on to medical anthropology and said, Don Martin Hill is in the anthropology department, speak to her. And I knew Don from previous um, um, activities. And so I approached her and she agreed to be my supervisor. And it actually worked out to be a positive experience to be in medical anthropology because it gave me the freedom of separating from that world of biomedical health science uh, that only relies on one system. And so I was able to explore and dive into Indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing language and so forth. And so um, I was recruited eventually to the Faculty of Health Science and asked to head up the development of an Indigenous health strategy in education. And so I wanted to share that with you because that pathway is what we're trying to address, that we are, you know, reaching out to our youth, encouraging them to go into health sciences, and not only getting them here, but creating a way that they're successful and they're satisfied and they're in a culturally safe environment. And so that's what this um, initiative is all about. And so now I'll, I'll uh, move on to the presentation. And so what you see here, of course, is some information related to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action and um, our Indigenous health strategy, which has complete commitment by the faculty leadership, uh, is meant to be TRC responsive. And if I'm sure that all of you here are familiar, but essentially the commission wanted us to focus on um, increasing the number of um, Indigenous uh, healthcare professionals um, to make sure that we were retaining them and supporting them in their practice, making sure that we were educating um, non-Indigenous healthcare professionals, and of course, asking medical and nursing schools um, to um, create courses so that um, everyone would learn about the historical issues related to Indigenous health and the measures um, and collaborative opportunities that we have developed through, for instance, the UNDRIP and um, other, other uh, processes. And so the strategic planning began um, in 2017 when I was recruited. I advised that the first year would be about relationship building, that there was a lot of mistrust, that our communities were you know, not too sure how well McMaster was you know, um, responding to their needs. Um, there's often a, not a separation between the education part of McMaster and the treatment uh, of our people in the hospital, for example. Um, so we had a lot of work to do there. And outreach to various uh, community and organizations was also a big part of that to involve people in the strategic planning process. 
education and awareness was also a big part of it. So many people had heard nothing about, you know, what had happened to people in residential school, for example. We also wanted to have our work inclusive of elders. And so a knowledge helpers group was struck. Two of, of uh, our colleagues from the knowledge helpers group are with us this evening. And um, my apologies, I should have uh, provided a, a, an opportunity of introduction. Um, to each of them. And so I'm going to pause now and invite uh, Wazadio Hill to introduce herself and uh, George Johnson, who are, are both on the line. So I'll stop my share for a moment to do that. Got carried away with myself there. Um, so uh, Wazadio, do you want to go first? Okay, so we may have a bandwidth problem. Um, how about George? Yeah, Sky, no, you, can you hear me? We can, yes. Okay, yeah, this uh, Hong Hien is my uh, traditional name. Uh, yeah, I've been uh, given an opportunity to work with uh, Bernice and faculty down there and McMaster, and it was interesting, you know, to you know go back and and kind of look back, I guess, where we came. And, and it's it been in the works, I think, for the last 20 some years with uh, Tom Deere and, and Harvey Lombo and stuff, stuff like that. And we're just trying to, you know, make it make it so that, uh, you know, uh, I like going to those meetings that we with the Dean and Vice Dean. I said, I, I was telling them that, you know, that I, I like sitting not too far away from them. So I, I can tell what they're talking about. <laughs> anyway, but it was interesting. and then. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, you know, I, I didn't realize, you know, that it, the way things were, you know, in, in those, in those uh, settings and, but, you know, like we come a long way, you know, with, with our knowledge helpers and knowledge holders and, and indigenous studies like that. And, uh, and it's really interesting, you know, to continue, uh, we're still going to continue and try to bring it out to, to the communities all, all around us. Yeah. That's all I have to say right now. Yeah. Yeah, with George. Um, so Wasantio may join us at some point, but maybe perhaps as part of the uh, comments. Um, so I'll just quickly go back. Um, so engagement, as I mentioned, was an important component. Uh, we had a visioning session. We had a gathering of traditional practitioners. Um, George made an important point that uh, this work is not new. It builds on years of work and engagement with the Six Nations community. Um, my colleagues who are engaged in this work uh, from the very beginning, as I mentioned, Don Martin Hill, uh, Rick Montour, Vanessa Watts Palace, all folks who have uh, um, contributed to um, this process. But within the Faculty of Health Science, this is the the broader uh, concerted effort of commitment that, uh, that they're making. So all of this strategic planning process resulted in a recommendation that we establish a structural entity within the Faculty of Health Science. And um, so as part of that, uh, part of that process, um, it was determined that we would um, lead this work within the faculty in tandem with the uh, programs, um, the various health science programs. And what you see here is a list of the overall objectives that we wanted to achieve, primarily address barriers, improve uh, health education services and program, uh, to be inclusive, uh, to promote um, indigenous faculty, um, support mechanisms for the faculty who are there. Often our faculty, our Indigenous faculty are isolated in their departments and experience racism and resistance to their good work. Um, we wanted to um, promote and align Indigenous leadership and accountability mechanisms um, and so forth. And so once the strategic uh, planning session was completed, this was the recommendation that was made. Um, this is uh, an image of our uh, existing logo. We hope in, with the launch of the lodge that we will have uh, a different name. Uh, the Knowledge Helpers Group will be working on that. Uh, but this is the logo to give that visual acknowledgement to both Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe um, values and uh, symbolism. 
Um, these are some of the successes to date. Uh, so the strategic plan, as I mentioned, the multiple stakeholder engagement, um, training of close to 300 individuals, the cultural safety training, uh, enhancing the infrastructure, which I'll come back to, uh, more recently appointment of an associate dean, Indigenous Health, which is myself, an agreement that the lodge needed to be funded um, by the Faculty of Health Science. Um, and so I'm going to skip over this just in the interest of time. I apologize for the tininess here of the image, but it is a visual of how the lodge is situated within the faculty. So you can see the central hub. And then we have external hubs here. So these are entities or areas um, dealing with Indigenous health, uh, for example, uh, working with Dwada Desne, working with Grand Erie Six Nations. Uh, Dr. Amy Montour was director there um, and you know, collaborating on efforts. You see a community hub at the bottom here, and that hasn't been um, developed yet. And that's where we're hoping that uh, both with Six Nations of the Grand River Territory and Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, that we will continue to collaborate and determine how best the lodge um, can support your work in the area of health, policy, education, um, and issues as they arise. Uh, for example, uh, we also have an Indigenous mental health working group, and I've reached out uh, to both communities to inquire about how we might be supportive in the fallout of this uh, CAM Loops uh, discovery. Uh, we also did an outreach uh, to your community when COVID happened to see how could the faculty support uh, your efforts uh, in whatever way possible. So we met weekly with representatives from your health team. Um, we also have a COVID study coming up and I think it's an ideal opportunity for Six Nations to look at what, what was helpful during that and what was missing in terms of um, support and infrastructure, for example. And so we hope to um, take our cue from communities about how we might support what's happening in, in, in the area of health and health education. And so um, this next slide zeroes in on the, the, uh, the, the central hub. And these are the uh, array of, of foci um, that will be, um, uh, sorry, this is still the external one. This is the central hub. So we have for a long time had our Indigenous Students um, Health Science Office that will continue, but is now part of the structure of the lodge. And we have various areas of foci. So you can see, like our knowledge helper said, we want to continue to be involved in this work and talk to practitioners and talk with the students. There is a there will be a place for them in the lodge. We also are establishing an Indigenous faculty community of practice a research focus and curriculum development. And so I'll just go back to, um, um, to this slide for a moment. So you can see here that um, as part of the uh, harmonization of the infrastructure with the Faculty of Health Science, we will continue to interface with the Indigenous Education Council, which is the um, Indigenous Council that uh, for the broader university. We, we also want to establish an Indigenous Health Advisory Council for this learning lodge. And so that's an invitation to Six Nations to consider representation on that council to have a direct link and to be able to inform and advise about what kind of supports or ideas can um, be helpful um, to the community. And so right now we are engaged in a process of both awareness, which includes this meeting, and also uh, Wasantio is meeting with, hopes to meet with the clan mothers to talk to them further. And George is also uh, leading, uh, hopefully because of the COVID interruption, when it's safe to do so, a uh, conversation with the traditional confederacy and we also are consulting Mississaugas of the Credit and our urban community. And so I see what time it is now, and I, I, I'm going to stop there. Uh, there's, there's a little bit more information, but this is the gist of it, um, just in light of, uh, I know you have a packed agenda. Um, so I'm open to um, any questions, or if Wasantio is on the line and wants to say a few words, um, that'd be fine too. Make quick. 
Okay, now I'm going to have Dr. Bernice uh, for your presentation. Uh, I do now want to look to see if there are any questions or comments. Not seeing any screens come on or anything, so it's, it, it seems that if people uh, people have a well understanding of, of where we're headed. I know also Bernice, uh, we've been uh, our office is going to be meeting. I believe we're scheduled for next week. Okay. It's been so uh, crazy our schedules, uh, but I believe uh, even further just to gain more information, so we could even further allow uh, council to provide even more information as uh, as we progress here. Great, and I'm also happy to submit uh, a briefing note, which will provide background information that fits with the uh, slides that I presented. And so that can be made available to the full council as well uh, in the event they you know, want some time to think about it and ask questions at some point. So um, uh, I, I'm not sure if Wasantio is still on the line. Um, I don't see any new joiners. It's okay. okay. Yes. All right, well, uh, Nyawa and uh, Migwitch for the time, and uh, it was it was great to be here with all of you. Okay, Nyawa as well, thank you, Dr. Bernice, and looking forward to our meeting next week and furthering the conversations. Uh, with just care. that being said, uh, can I then get a motion to accept uh, the presentation from Dr. Bernice Downey from McMaster University as information moved by Michelle, second by Audrey. Are there any further questions or comments? Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motions carried. Again, Yawa, Dr. Bernice for joining us this evening. Miigwech and uh, enjoy the rest of your meeting. And hi, Audrey. <laughs> hey, how are you doing, Bernice? Very good, it's good to see you. <laughs> it, was, it was nice to hear George, George on the line as well. Oh, George, is, George has been amazing. We've met weekly with our knowledge helpers and uh, you know, over food before COVID, food and lots of laughter and George has been a big part of that. So now with George for joining and um, I sent my greetings on behalf of uh, Wasatio as well. Hey, Gwitch. No, no, no. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, Nyawa, so much. Okay, Council, we will then now shift into our, our next delegation, uh, which is uh, Arliss Guy, our Director of Social Services, as well as Yvette Martin, uh, Manager of our Six Nations Daycare. Again, this, is, this isn't to go in depth. As, a, as you, you will recall, we, we did have the same presentation uh, that was in front of us about maybe two months ago or so. Uh, so that being said, it's really just a run, a run through, again, a quick through of the presentation of the reopening of Six Nations daycares, uh, followed by the emergency control group hybrid framework discussion. So this is all really going to tie in uh, as we move through these next uh, presentations. Uh, that being said, I will, uh, good evening and welcome Arliss and Yvette. Uh, I will pass the floor right over to yourselves to go through uh, your presentation on the reopening of Six Nations daycares. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the time to come and um, update and um, provide this um, presentation on our um, service in-person service delivery plan. So Yvette will be doing the presentation and I think she has share screen um, access there. Um, we also have a video that, that was attached to the, um, to the end of the presentation. I'm not sure whether we have time to look at it or not, but that can be shared after as well. Good evening. Um, I just wanted to share um, what we have been working on within the child care program. So what I did was I presented a slide that's going to show you the amendments that were being made through the process of the COVID with the ministry guidelines, protocol changes. Um, so this is our strategy and recovery plan. So uh, again, it's our license program um, that we want to open and operate. Uh, we're looking at just operating with our preschool programs to start off with. Um, and the importance of the strategy and recovery plan is to ensure that the safety of the children, families, and staff um, and, and controlling the infection prevention part. The service delivery plan, it 
um, was developed uh, with the support of the Oswegan Public Health Department and the recommendations that were provided by the Ministry of Education. Um, the guidance document, the last one that we had received was March uh, 2021 and version five. So our strategy and recovery plan is that the early years program in, in Ontario in, in September 1st, 2020, the other child care centers were able to operate at full capacity. Um, and we remain into the COVID um, enclosure. Our early on programs are operating through virtual services. We are waiting for a ministry update at this time to when we can provide um, on site programs and services. So this is our child care staffing that we would like to start off with. Uh, with our last proposal, we said that we were going to have a cohort of eight children uh, to two teachers. Um, so at Bicentennial, we are looking at opening up three preschool programs. Um, so we're going to have licensed 24 children with six staff, and we got three support staff for the programs to assist with cleaning and disinfecting and sanitizing. Plus, we're going to also have our support staff, admin staff on site as well. Stone Ridge Children's Center, we're going to be looking at opening up two preschool programs. Um, and then we're licensed there for 16 children. Um, and then there's going to be two, the ratio of eight to two. And then we have our support staff and admin staff also going to be on site. So that will be providing child care for uh, 40 children. The other thing we're looking at too is we're going to be utilizing the Ministry of Education plan that we're going to be servicing children that are having working parents within those three guidelines. So we are in the red alert. And so in the red alert, we are, it says that childcare can be in operation with enhanced restrictions. And the enhanced instructions um, for us is that we need to, the staff need to pre-screen one hour prior to um, coming into the program. So we have that already set up and staff are providing text um, emails to the supervisors, um, of letting the supervisors know of their conditions and that they have no COVID um, symptoms. And also the parents are required to screen one hour prior to their child's um, contract hours. And we use the Hi Mama app for that. The rule is with the Ministry of Education if that there is no pre-screen, then there's no child care services. To... So the recommendation through the Schwiegen Public Health was that we are, uh, they would let, they asked us to put this statement into our policy, our restructuring recovery and strategy plan that if child care services has five or more COVID cases within a two week span that our centers have to close for 10 days for sanitizing and ensuring that um, we put our safety pro protocols in place and that we're meeting the needs of the children and a safety aspect of it. Recor reporting a series of currents, there's changes with that. The ministry now has adopted an online portal to submitting any serious occurrence and monitoring confirmed cases. Uh, and now there is a spot within that document that public health is required to also make contact and put their information in. Um, just to let you know, another change in new provincial guideline for us that changed is that if any um, child has any symptoms, any staff or providers have any symptoms, um, they must stay at home until they're able to provide a negative COVID test. Um, they receive alternate diagnosis from a healthcare professional, or they've been 10 days without any symptoms and they're feeling well. So those are the three guidelines that would allow staff and children and providers to return back to the child care program. We have a, a, a wellness room, a COVID-19 wellness room. Um, six, Bicentennial Trail was requested to have two classrooms set up as a wellness room just for extra support because of the 24 children that we had on site to provide proper safety and social distancing. 
Um, so we have the person caring for the individual will be required to wear full PPE. Um, and then there's a cleaning of the program in the areas of where the child was. And uh, we purchased aeroclaves, an aeroclave. So we're using that as sanitizing and disinfecting any areas. So this is a picture of our wellness room and it's posted to the level alert that we are at. At the bottom of the door, there's um, a sign that lets you know how many people are welcome into the wellness room. And then staff will wear people PPE when cleaning. Staff will dispose PPE in a separate garbage bag and seal. So we did an amendment for the employees as well to prepare them for reopening um, and supporting them through the transition of the changes within childcare and the childcare services that we're going to offer. So one of the changes that come through with the ministry is that early years in childcare staff are no longer required to stay on site for lunches. So now we're able to go out in the community, have our lunches and come back. A reduction of the full PPE when social distances can be remained. And this is mostly for the outdoor activities and the outdoor times that we will be with the children so that if the children are playing and we can maintain that social distance, we don't have to have full PPE on. So we, I we have prepared, the supervisors and myself have prepared orientation package for the employees. So what we've been doing is these are a list of the information that staff need to be aware of and the changes with protocols and procedures for us to operate. So they've been going through this, reviewing these guidelines, reviewing these procedures to ensure that we are all on the same page in terms of our relationship, our role and responsibility for maintaining the safety and well-being of our children. <clears throat> And then this is the human resources. These are all of the policies and, and the packages that they provided for staff orientation. We also included that because we do have some staff that have been working at home um, that have not come back on site. So we're trying to keep this communication and this relationship open with them as well, with reviewing and ensuring that they are aware of the policies and procedures and the changes. So the protective measures that we have we are taking is that we're going to ensure that everyone does the online screening one hour prior to their shift. Um, staff um, <clears throat> will be talking with staff and the supervisors will be interacting with the staff uh, throughout the day just to monitor and ensure that everyone is is safe and uh, they're well um, and ensuring that there's no other symptoms or any changes within their health. We, are going to, we have documented announcements that the receptionists are doing throughout the child care programs. They're announcing when it's time to wash our hands, um, to sanitize high touch surface areas. Um, during the outdoor time, classrooms will be air, air sanitized um, by our housekeeper and anyone else. And with our people that are supporting the programs, they can help with that too. And the windows are open daily to allow that fresh air rotation. So when we're reporting that serious occurrence, I wanted to add this slide because it, it's very important that we're aware that whenever there's a COVID case, it's our responsibility um, to report and complete an incident report. And it's our responsibility to ensure that it's reported on the one, one online portal. And it's also important that we allow and let our public health department know. So this is helping us control the measures of what's going on within our child care program. Um, and once this is reported with a serious occurrence, we follow the um, public health guidelines. Um, and the serious occurrence notification form will have to, is required to be posted on the entrance door for all child care programs. And that is under the Early Years in Child Care Act. Cleaning and, and, and disinfecting routines have been increased. Um, it's mandatory that staff complete check, checklists and cleaning hygiene documentation. Um, and then 
cleaning has been is completed on iPhones, iPads, any computers and things that any user uses, they have to disinfect that. Management of our flow system. So at this time, parents and visitors are still not allowed into our programs until further notice. The front entrance is for we have separate entrances, one for arrivals and one for departures. Children will meet at the front entrance. Why we have the children meet at the front entrance? Because the screening is done so we know who's rotating and coming in and out of the building. And departure is located at the side door. <clears throat> outdoor programs. Each program will be provided um, an outdoor rolling cart. And it's going to be equipped with all the essential things along with their um, emergency contact information, their first aid kits, EpiPens, Kleenex, gloves, all the things that they're required when they're outdoors. Well, I'm going too fast. So our recommendation for Six Nations Elected Council is to accept our um, updated reopen plan um, to approve that our licensed child cares can open under the rate, the 25% capacity, and that uh, we allow our private home daycares to offer services for our children. Um, and then hopefully within the four weeks, revisiting and reassessing to add more children into the program, and hoping that we can be at full capacity by January 2022, depending if we can be COVID free. And I also was requesting the Six Nations Council uh, to approve the opening of in-person visits for the early on pro program. Once the ministry um, announces the guidelines and procedures that's going to take place, because right now they're still on virtual um, and I don't know if you want to see a um a video or yeah okay. so, so this video is really outlining what the child care programs has been up to within this last year we wanted to highlight the services that we were providing for families. This little soul with Stone Ridge Children's Center, these are bit characters that they have. They're flat characters that they send with the children. So when they're doing their virtual online learning, those are the teachers that they're, they're having discussion with. So there is one other video, and this is the tour of the child care program. This is a video that we're offering for parents. As you approach the center, you can hear it. Oh, 
and it hosted the indicator. So we'll just say like C or G here. We also have hand sanitizer located on the side of the building. You will be required to pre-screen via a Google document that will be sent to my mama. You and your child will both be actively screened at the door. Our screeners are wearing full PPE, mask, shield, gloves, gown. You will have a series of questions to answer and both of your temperatures will be taken. If the screenings are passed, your child will be able to participate Come and see the center. This is our screening station. We have a thermometer, hand sanitizer. During this time, parents and guardians will not be allowed in the center. The screener will help your child change into their indoor shoes, hang up their belongings, and wash their hands prior to entering the room. This is our bathroom. Only one child will be allowed in the box at a time. This is the eagle room. Signage are posted for the children to indicate physical distancing. The floors are marked off to create areas for the children to play. The tables have a plexiglass barrier to prevent cross-contamination during eating. If your child shows signs or symptoms, parents will be contacted and they will be provided care in our wellness room until parents arrive. The child care programs will provide the children measurement tools to encourage their understanding of social distancing. We have visual signage and cues that remind staff and children to their role and responsibility as part of their daily prevention measures. During this time, we will be taking the program outdoors to encourage outdoor play. We will have this bin full of all the materials needed to keep us safe. The teachers will also be pre-screening one hour before their shift and actively screened at the door. They also will be changing into scrubs to ensure safety. Yama yeah, for taking our tour. Now it is time to go. The parents will text and the teacher will escort the child to the parking lot. Bye for now and hope to see you soon. Have a great night. So what we're looking at, if we have the, the permission to reopen, this is one of the things that are gonna be posted on the Hi Mama app for our parents. And Stone Ridge Children's Center also completed a video with their program. It's on here as well. I don't know if you wanna see that as well, or if you just wanna move into any questions or that you might have. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Yvette. I think at this point in time, it'd be nice to maybe shift into discussion. Yep. Um, and see uh, see if there's any questions or comments at this point. It's really helpful. I'm really glad that your staff and team have provided these uh, videos. I know it's super helpful for parents as well uh, to at least uh, you know go through that walkthrough and that experience and what it will look like when schools uh, or rather daycares uh, do reopen. So again, just want to give a little uh, kudos or rather big kudos to your staff and team. I know it's been a challenging time, but just seeing the, the, the smiling faces of the young ones on screen and through Zoom, it's really uh, brings, you know, further, uh, further light to the end of the tunnel here while we're, while we're dealing with COVID. So really appreciate that. Thank you for that. I do want to look to any questions or comments at this point in time. I do see Wendy has her hand up. Thanks, Mark. And thanks, Beth. Great presentation. Very thorough. Uh, just a couple of questions, um, and, and maybe I missed it. Just wondering about rapid testing for staff. I don't know if that's something that you're doing or will be implementing as part of the whole process as well. And then uh, testing for children, because I, as I understand it, our testing services do not include children. So I don't know how that would occur if there's, there's a, a process for that as well. So with the rapid testing, I know that's in conversation that Arliss and I are having um, at this time to see if that's what we're going to provide for our program and for our staff. 
I know that um, we have a child care program that is open in Brantford. It's the urban uh, Clarence Street child care program and children have been tested for COVID um, within their program. So I don't know if Six Nations, if that's the direction that we're going to take um, at this time. And if I may, just one more question. So, so because of the numbers just starting out and, and the percentage, so how do you determine who is eligible for the first round of intake um, in that did, process? We did. Um, we looked at the children that we had provided care for that are already registered on our list. So that really covers our waiting list to start off with. Um, and if we were to if some parents didn't meet the criteria or guidelines, and then we would look at our waiting list to contact the clients to come in to create children to have access to our care. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your questions, Wendy, and your responses, Yvette. Uh, also just wanted to acknowledge uh, our Director of Health, Lori Davis-Hill, had posted in the chat, our assessment center does test children. We arrange for in-home testing if necessary uh, to increase their comfort. I just wanted to acknowledge uh, that in the chat box as well. Uh, is there any further questions or comments for Yvette or Arliss? Again, do agree. Uh, Melba? Oh, my apologies. Uh, Sorry. Melba? Sorry, go ahead, Melba. Yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate also the presentation and you're very thorough. And it looks like the children and yourselves and staff are going to be taken care of very well doing everything that you can think of possible to keep everyone safe. So, um, and if there is no more, I would make that recommendation. Okay, so Melba is moving on the recommendation. And sorry, just to be clear, um, Yvette, can you just pull up your last slide of the recommendation slide? Because this will fall, really council, this will really fall into our next presentation as well, as you see on, uh, in your Dropbox, uh, the uh, hybrid framework in which we discussed as well. I think you just want just really quickly as well while Yvette's pulling that up. Uh, I do also just want to comment to say, you know, I think it, it, as, as much as it was very difficult to make that decision to close daycares and schools and so forth and how hard it was on our parents. It really shows that it gave that time uh, to really put in thorough plans and from your presentation and videos can really uh, can really appreciate your staff and the plans uh, and the time that we've taken in order to continue to put the health and safety first, especially of our children. So just wanted to make that comment as well. Uh, I see Wendy has her hand up. Yeah, I'd be happy to second the motion because I think at, at this point it's up to the parents. I mean, I, from the presentation, everything is in place, the guidelines, you know, provincial, our own guidelines, all of that is in the works. And right now it's up to the parents, right? To work with the system and if they decide um, to send their children to, to daycare. But I'm just wondering in, in terms of timing, because we have the update on the framework next, I, I assume that they're working in tandem and, and you know, yeah. they're feeding off of one another, but should we hear the framework first and then do both motions together just out of, you know, process sequence? So you're you're you you are reading my mind, Wendy. I was actually going to request that we do hold off on this recommendation until our next presentation, um, just so again that we'll have more. Because um, uh, like, you're right, it does go hand in hand. And again, if we can just look to the mover, uh, Melba, uh, if you're that's if fine. you're willing, okay, perfect. That's fine. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to uh, to say is that we listen to the next uh, the next presentation. Uh, look for a decision uh, on that one and then pull this recommendation back if that's okay with council. Okay, Yvette, uh, that being said in our list, just want to say Nyawa and thank you for presenting to council this evening. And if you could just hang on, hang and stand by for uh, the next little while while we go through uh, this next presentation, then we'll, we'll get to your recommendation. Yeah, well, for the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah, and we always follow too. Um, we always get updates from the Ministry of Education, and and we, uh, it's a, like an ongoing, a moving document. So we bring that to the planning committee as well, and and um, update them as on all of the changes that are being made. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that, Arliss. Uh, okay, Council. So our next uh, presentation and delegation is the from the Emergency Control Group. 
uh, which is the hybrid framework. I know we've talked about this already uh, in terms of what we've seen the province now shift into in uh, their three-stage reopening plan. Uh, we're very much going to be continuing with our own framework, obviously with modifications in place. So this is really a, a hybrid model to, to suit exactly what we've been um, what we've been discussing. So with that being said, I will pass it right over to Sarah who will walk us through uh, the new hybrid framework. Okay, hey, I'm just gonna share screen. Okay, good evening, uh, community chief and council. So today I will be presenting on the updates that have been made to the to the Six Nations COVID-19 pandemic framework. So this is what we are calling internally the hybrid approach, taking what the province is doing and aligning the sectors in some situations, which makes sense for us. So I'm not stable right now, so I'm sorry if I'm glitching. Um, and considering our local context. So the goal of these amendments is to number one, increase access for community activities, which support mental and physical well-being, and encourage the community to stay local to keep COVID-19 out of the community. Number two, um, while maintaining that, we want to ensure risk is mitigated enough to not create high-risk scenarios in which transmission is uncontrolled and our community health system is unable to respond. So the priority has always been and remains to protect our people. To begin, I will provide some background into this plan. So the Six Nations COVID-19 framework was developed as part of an overall pandemic recovery plan, which was developed in May, 2020. December, 2020, the Six Nations COVID-19 response framework was implemented and the framework provides guidelines for measures in place based on the level of risk of transmission and the community response capacity. So the current context, in March, vaccines became available to Six Nations. May 20th, Ontario announced their three-step roadmap to reopen. And June 2nd, Six Nations moved to alert level red. June 5th, we held our first clinic for 12 to 17 year olds, where 132 12 to 17 year olds were vaccinated. On June 11th, the province will move to step one. So the table I have here shows the vaccine coverage between Six Nations and Ontario. So Ontario is utilizing vaccine coverage for their adult population. So as you can see here, Currently, as of June 3rd, Ontario has achieved 67% of their adult population with vaccine coverage. Um, if you look at what that is for their total population, it is about is 56%. So to compare with Six Nations, if we only look at our adults 18 plus vaccine coverage, we're at about 45%. And with our total population, we're at 35%. Now, I do wanna recognize our data does have limitations. So we have our internal tracking of our vaccine coverage. And, and we also know that community members have gone off reserve to receive their vaccination. So what we're relying on for our off reserve va vaccinations for in community members is ICES, who utilizes data linkage with provincial databases and the Indian registry. So there are limitations of this data source, and that includes um, anyone who was vaccinated outside of Ontario will not be included. And to some further uh, further researching, um, the anyone who has an OHIP card and postal code which does not match their Indian registry postal code, the data is able to be linked. So there are limitations to all data sources, and those are our limitations. We have made steps to make our uh, vaccine coverage more accurate. So we've encouraged Six Nations community members to self-report their off-reserve vaccination to the public health, 
Um, to date, we've received less than 500 off-reserve vaccinations, and through ICS reporting, we do know that is much higher. So I just want to um, note anyone who's received a uh, COVID-19 vac vaccine, please report this to Oshwigan Public Health to help with our vaccine coverage accuracy. Um, we've also engaged other health units. So uh, Brant County, they're reporting 57. We're from on an off-reserve vaccination event who have a on-reserve address. And in Hamilton Public Health, there are 26. We're still waiting to hear from Haldeman Northrop, but we are trying to increase the accuracy of this data as much as possible. But this is where it stands at this time. So the process for updating. So IMT began reviewing the COVID-19 response framework for revisions in March. Sorry, sorry, to sorry to interrupt, Sarah. I know you're having connectivity issues. I, I was experiencing the same thing yesterday. It might be helpful if you just stop your, your screen and that way we could just hear your audio. I know that that may help as well. My apologies, back to you. Sure, is that better? All right, good. Um, so we have identified missing areas and areas which needed updating. Um, once Ontario announced their reopening plan, a SWOT analysis was conducted to look at our different options regarding utilizing the provincial framework, maintaining what we had, or updating our existing framework. So gaining feedback from IMT, the incident management team, the emergency control group, and Six Nations elected council, we have revised accordingly to deliver these proposed updates today. So what was decided through these discussions and analysis of our options was that we would maintain <clears throat> our COVID-19 response framework and amend to better reflect Six Nations communities' needs and context while mitigating the risk. So the reason being we want to maintain consistency. So we want to maintain, we don't want to throw away the plan so people have to get used to a new plan. Um, number two, we want to consider the local context. So the provincial reopening plan is taking into account large cities, um, medium-sized cities, counties, all different kinds of contexts, whereas um, our Six Nations context is much different. So we want to ensure that we're evaluating using our own indicators. We're considering that our local sectors um, and considering our own vaccine coverage thresholds. So community has more fully vaccinated than the province. Currently, the province is at 5%, and we are sitting at 29% fully vaccinated community members living on reserve. But we do have a lower percent that have received their first dose. We want to be inflexible and adaptable to changing context with a built-in review process to ensure the plan is up to date on current evidence and context. In addition, our existing plan has an evaluation method um, that we have been able to fine tune throughout this year um, with our own Six Nations data. So as I mentioned, the, the revised COVID-19 response framework increases access to activities, promotes well-being and try, attempt, trying to promote well-being for Six Nations community members to and encourages the community to stay local, to try to limit the spread of COVID-19 and keep COVID-19 out of the community. While we do still have a large portion of the community unvaccinated, we will need to maintain public health restrictions and take a slow and cautious approach as we reduce restrictions. So number one, we've clarified the approval process for alert level changes, just so it's clear that we do have a process that we are following and ensuring movement through our alert levels is based on the level of risk to the community, as well as our community health system capacity with a clear evaluation method. So the way it currently stands is every week, incident management team completes a risk assessment based on our indicators with the recommendation based on what the risk assessment is showing. Uh, this recommendation goes to ECG, ECG sends this recommendation to council who will either approve or reject the recommendation. 
Council will then, if approved, the community is then notified of this change in alert level. That's the current process. Um, number two, we've updated indicators. So like I said, over this past year, we've really uh, developed um, thresholds for where we're seeing our community health system be strained and what those indicators look like. So we've included percent positivity, our effective reproductive number, thresholds for those, and our paramedic capacity as they have been integral to our uh, response. We've added vaccine coverage to the criteria to decrease the alert levels. So I will provide that, I believe in the next slide, a more detailed information regarding that. We've updated gathering sizes. We've placed a stronger emphasis that sectors provide services and events outdoors. So we know that outdoors, the did is about a 6% increase on vaccine coverage. So having a 3% increase over two weeks is a realistic, uh, realistic goal. Um, the 61% comes into play as Ontario's benchmark for step three, that's the last step in their reopening plan is 75%. So this equates to 61% of Ontario's total population for vaccine coverage. So the reason that is there is just in case, um, the benchmark will ensure if we suppose we have a significant increase in one week that we won't get stuck in a specific uh, alert level. So for example, uh, one week we may uh, see a 40% increase in vaccine coverage, which would be great. Um, the following weeks, we might not see a 3% increase, um, but we would be more vaccinated than Ontario. So we don't want to get stuck in a certain alert level. So that's why that benchmark is there. If we reach 61%, that's where Ontario's reaching. Um, that's where we would stop having that criteria to increase vaccine coverage week to week. Um, and then lastly, we use total on reserve population rather than just our adults to maintain consistency. So as the vaccine becomes more available to people um, and you're looking at only those eligible, the vaccine coverage will actually appear to go down if you start including those in your eligibility calculation. So to maintain consistency, we're using total on reserve population. Um, in addition, it provides a better picture of who is protected and who is not. So you can easily see that you have, if we reach 61%, we'd have 61% of our total population protected through vaccination, and we would have the rest 39% unprotected. Uh, the next section is we've updated a gathering size definition. So a gathering size is a group of people who are distanced by two meters within an area. So this over here is a group of people two meters distance. These people are a group of two meters distance. They are not interacting with one another, so they're considered two gathering sizes. So where this comes into play is, for example, if you if there is a gathering of five or 10 on a soccer field, and on the other side, there is a gathering of five or 10 on the other side, they are not interacting with each other at any point. Those are considered two different gathering sizes. So just to provide further clarity um, when we're looking at gathering sizes. Which brings me to the updated gathering sizes. So, we have just simplified gathering sizes to provide guidance for sectors and people holding events on what those gathering sizes are, rather than differentiating between monitored and unmonitored gatherings. So within Black, uh, there are no gatherings. It's only those within your immediate household. Within Red, it's five indoors or only within your immediate household and 10 outdoors. Within orange, it's 10 indoors, 25 outdoors. Yellow, 25 indoors, 50 outdoors. And green, 50 indoors, 100 outdoors. Um, just for reference, I have the Ontario's gathering sizes 
for their uh, steps. So uh, within this aspect, the province is more restrictive uh, than us um, because they're accounting for other areas which are much larger than us, as well as uh, levels with high transmission. Update number three. So we've just added a line that the plan will be re-reviewed if context of the COVID-19 pandemic significantly changes, or it has been at least three months since the last review process. So the rationale for this is that the COVID-19 pandemic can change quickly. So there can be a significant provincial changes. There can be changes to the vaccine with it becoming more available. Significant, there could be significant changes to our vaccine coverage and the virus itself can, can, can change our context. So the variants of concerns. Um, so we need to be flexible and adaptable as we learn more. Um, and we want to make sure that community is aware that the framework may change based on changing context. And there is a process in place for reviewing. We've also added a new section the criteria for ending alert levels. So the COVID, so when we would end the alert levels is if COVID-19 is no longer a threat that will cause severe illness and death in Six Nations community members. There are no new virus subtypes that have been detected in humans. Mm -hmm. If present, risk of human infection is considered low. Ending of our alert level system would in indicate we have entered the inter-pandemic period of our pandemic response plan. So this is the criteria we currently have, is number one, herd immunity is reached as defined by global consensus. So currently, the threshold for herd immunity is not known. There is not consensus on what that is or what that looks like. Number two, treatments are available for those infected with COVID-19 to prevent severe and fatal outcomes. Number three, the virus mutates into a less virulent virus. So for example, if the virus mutates into something more like a common cold, where we're not seeing uh, long-term impacts of COVID-19 or people aren't being hospitalized um, or dying from COVID-19. So this is the update around, across, sorry, sectors open across the alert levels. So it's in black, the new change is to include schools and childcare in alert level black and across. This, the reason being is schools and childcare have, uh, have worked very closely with the Shrigan Public Health and have uh, a lot of planning has gone into ensuring that these are safe environments for children. Um, for alert level red, outdoor and indoor recreational facilities. So this aligns with the province outdoor recreational facility fitness classes. So this is something that's unique to Six Nations. So allowing outdoor recreational and fitness classes to be, to occur. Team sports with only training, outdoor dining, that is different from the province um, in their pre-step one. Personal care, campgrounds, and non-essential retail for curbside pickup delivery. For orange, it's all the sectors in red, plus team sports, indoor recreational and fitness classes, day camps, indoor dining, non-essential retail with capacity restrictions, motorsports speedway with crew only. In yellow, all sectors in orange, motorsports speedway, spectators allowed, some large community events. And in green, all sectors in yellow with reduced restrictions on gathering sizes. I'm just going to go through a, some of the sectors, not all of them, um, but some of them that have been widely discussed. So outdoor and indoor recreational facilities. So these include the skateboard park, walking tracks, sports fields, splash pads and playgrounds, and any, any other recreational facilities that this is applicable to. Indoor recreational facilities, this includes gymnasiums, community centers, multi-purpose facilities, arenas, and other recreational facilities. So within red, 
outdoor sports recreational classes is five, no indoor. And across outdoor, 10 and five for orange, yellow, 25 and 10, and green, uh, open with capacity restrictions. Across all of these, it's to permit a three meter distancing. <clears throat> this is to align with the gym and fitness recommendation of, and I'd like to highlight, this is for classes, not for gathering sizes within these uh, facilities. Um, to permit three meter distancing, the reason there's a three meter distancing recommendation is um, in these, in these uh, scenarios, there may be people breathing heavily. So that's uh, been known to increase the risk of transmission. So we're just recommending that there be further distance between people if that is occurring. There's a separate section for team sports. So this includes sports that are played within a team setting. <clears throat> Um, within red, all team sports are limited to the gathering sizes, um, ensuring there are minimal team size and training only. And across all the alert levels, the team sports are limited to gathering sizes, so that be in terms of spectators and minimal team sizes. And a note here, return to play plans need to be approved by the emergency control group. And the reason being is just to provide uh, more guidance regarding uh, the various sports as they are all, they all have their own needs. So it's difficult to make recommendations across the board. So ECG would like to see those return to play plans um, prior to uh, implementing. Gyms and fitness, gyms and fitness Training centers are at a heightened risk uh, because people will be breathing heavier than normal. So it, exercising indoors in a group setting is risky and it is not recommended. So we are recommending that out, where possible that we have outdoor classes. In. So within RED, personal training, my internet is unstable, so I'm gonna pause. Okay, it says it's fine. Uh, personal training and outdoor only classes max of five and must permit three meter distancing within orange outdoor 10 indoor five permitting three meter distancing so this is the same guidance as provided to the so with our our educational uh, sector so across all alert levels, the guidance is open with restrictions based on ministry and Ashwigan public health guidance. So our schools and our childcare have customized reopening plans that include reduced classroom capacity, cohorting, and the gradual resumption of schools and childcare activities that have got, gone above and beyond um, what has occurred uh, off reserve. So as it's been mentioned, there's been a lot of planning that has been put into place within these settings. Um, we feel that it is essential for this to be maintained across all alert levels. Um, and then a note here for federal elementary schools, in-school learning will remain closed for the 2020-2021 school year. Children's day camps. So for alert level red, it's closed across all of the alert levels, uh, they would be following Ministry of Health State guidelines for day camps. Cohorts should not mix with other cohorts. Restaurants and food stands. Uh, so within red, we are allowing outdoor dining, orange limit of four people seated together, yellow limit of six, and for green indoor with capacity and other restrictions to permit two meter distancing. Same thing with outdoors, it's in yellow because that's the only thing that changed from the last framework. Um, and this just is just a brief overview of the measures of the, the updates that have uh, been implemented, been proposed. So highlighted is some additional measures that are recommending is prioritizing outdoor gatherings and meetings to over indoors wherever possible. And all those living and are working in our community should receive the COVID-19 vaccine as soon as possible. 
highly recommended. Um, reducing alert levels, I already went through that, and the gathering sizes. So this is just to provide a summary of what I already discussed. The next section is the communication strategy. So this is um, the strategy for the updates will be similar to the strategy for when the response framework first became implemented. So uh, the goals would be to inform the Six Nations community on the change from version one to version two, update the community on the colored alert level changes, um, continue to use various channels to provide ongoing updates to the Six Nations community on the current color alert level system, is in on a weekly basis and where to expect these regular updates. So the primary objectives will be to update various advertisements, newsprint ads, social media images, and other collateral materials to assist in the communications of the version two of the response framework, develop a social media plan to announce and promote, update the information package to provide community members informing them of the response framework version two. And those are just a summary of updating the current platforms, updating the collateral that has already been developed and using the various channels to provide an ongoing update. So that is the presentation that I have. So I'll turn it back over to Chief. Okay, Nyawa, and thank you, uh, Sarah, for, for providing that presentation uh, on the hybrid framework, or also known as the response framework version two. Looking to, um, to open up for any questions or comments at this time. I know that was a lot to take in, uh, but again, you know, we are looking to build this into further context of our community. I do see Helen has her hand up. Yeah, I'm curious as to why uh, the daycares are going to be open, but the day camps, children's day camps are closed because I've gotten a call from uh, Marion Martin who looks, who, who runs the, uh, red, the Red Barn. And she wondered if they would be able to have that this summer, but it sounds to me like probably not if day camp, outdoor day camps are closed, but so that, that would be a question I had. Like, what is the difference between having somebody kids in a daycare who will be playing outside, I'm sure, and closing children's day camps. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Helen, for your question. I'll pass it back over to Sarah. So in terms of the day camps, uh, it was decided to have them closed in red just because of the limits on the gathering sizes. Uh, the day camps, the child care centers have a stage reopening plan, um, which the day camps do not. Um, there, so there's differences in the planning that has gone on for the child care versus the day camps. So child care have been planning for over a year, um, implementing those strategies, working with the Shwigan Public Health, doing walkthroughs of their facilities. Um, the day camps, uh, we discussed having aligning with the gathering sizes um, and having them open for orange. Okay, and thanks, thanks for that, Sarah. Because I, I really, I think there's, there's two items, right? Is one to look at the, um, obviously looking to approve uh, version two and also looking to reduce our alert level uh, for this week. Uh, I believe that was part of the discussion as well. Um, I just want to go back to if Helen, if you have a substitute. Yeah, I'm not really happy with the answer. Um, the Red Barn, I'm sure, would have a, a, a plan in place if they had known they could possibly be open, but there's been no communication with different programs like that. It's, they didn't know when it was going to open. So she did say to me that they would certainly be making sure of, of all the COVID restrictions were they to be able to open, but I don't know if she has a plan in place per se, but I've, I don't know. So, and, and that was that was just to my point as well is, and I know it may not 
suffice, you, you know, for yourself, Helen. But I think if we move to orange, like prior in, in the time that we're in now, moving into the summer months, that would still provide day camps to be open and operating. So just thought that I, I maybe should get that out there as well. Uh, Wendy has her hand up. Yeah, thanks, Mark. And, and I agree with Helen. I mean, I, I don't think it's a sufficient, it's sufficient rationale to say that, <clears throat> excuse me, they don't have the the plan in place or they haven't seen it. So therefore, you know, they're not included on the list. I mean, the ECG, I mean, for lack of a better word, they're not just a regulator. I mean, they have these models, they have the work that's been done. So I would think they should be working with different organizations and um, like the day camp. And this is, you know, this is what you need. Here's a model, you know, can you comply with this and work with organization so that they can be open so that people can be moving forward because you know in everything that Sarah said and she said quite a bit but there's really not that many changes in the update there's only a few areas um, overall um, if we if we cut to the chase of, of what it is um, so I, I think we need to look at and I see in the chat there's a question about what is the implementation plan moving forward you know it, can we share, so how many cases have we had over the past month or the past two months? What does that look like on a chart? Um, are we holding with you know, one case, zero cases? And then how do we move forward based on that? What does that look like? Because I think the community is eager to see that as well, moving forward and what we have to do. And we know that this is driven by vaccinations as well. The more people we get vaccinated, then the more we can, we can open. You know, it's it's part and parcel. So, I mean, I think that would be an interesting piece, too. But I think we need to be working with community and helping community along rather than just saying, you know, no, they're not included because they didn't do this. Let's work together. Thanks, Wendy, for your, for your comments as well. And I, I totally agree with those pieces. In fact, one of the areas in what we've seen with our business Zoom meetings is that, you know, it'd be nice to give to give notice to businesses. I think uh, as you can see what's happening in the province, you know, it's not, uh, they're all prepared and, you know, the province makes a, a, an announcement that say, for example, outdoor patios and things like that can start to open up this Friday. Uh, and I seen on the news, you know, business owners are, are, are now scrambling to get product, to get set up, to do all these things. So now they have literally three days to get open for business when they've been closed for so long. So I agree with your, your comments, Wendy. We need to work together with our community members and our business owners, obviously, and to make sure the health and safety is up, up at the center. So uh, I would totally agree with, with those comments as well. Uh, I do wanna just really get to uh, the, the comment in coming from Facebook in the chat. Is there a proposed implementation phase plan and timeline for moving from one color code to the next? Example, red to orange to yellow, now for clarifying. So if I can, Sarah, if you could just maybe touch a little bit on, on that question for community. Sure. Um, so the criteria for reducing alert levels is based on our weekly risk assessment. So our re weekly risk assessment has a few components. Number one is the level of virus spread and containment within the community. So there are a few indicators we look at for that. Number one is obviously case counts, but that's not the only indicator that we look at. Uh, we also look at percent positivity. So how many positive tests are coming back out of the total tests that are, that are um, conducted? Number three is our effective reproductive number. So that is looking at how many secondary cases are coming from one primary case. So we want to start seeing reductions in our case numbers. We look at uh, having that below one. So we have thresholds for those indicators. In regards to our capacity within the community, so we look at our emergency medical service capacity. So the number of calls that they're receiving, the wait times that they are having at the hospitals. So the wait times at the hospitals take away ambulances from the community, uh, our public health capacity to do contact tracing. So that's important to ensure that we are isolating the COVID-19 cases and any contacts associated. And lastly, our assessment center capacity. So is this assessment center able to meet the demands of testing as well as community compliance? So is, are there reports of gatherings 
are there reports of um, people not following the public health precautions? So we take all of those into consideration. They have thresholds for each. Um, and if the risk of the over all of those components is low for two consecutive weeks, uh, then we reduce the alert level. And with the new criteria is we look at, has the vaccine coverage increased by 3%? If it's yes, then we would reduce the alert level. There is always a two week evaluation period. And the reason for that is um, to just, just ensure that any movements that are being made that we're not, we're not seeing uh, flare ups in cases. So we always want to ensure that we have that evaluation period. So right now we're seeing each week we're low risk. So it's um, a good indication of being able to, as long as we continue to stay low risk, we can continue to evaluate and move down the alert levels. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks Sarah for, for that. Um for your response. Again, I really feel like we have, and this is version two, right? So council, you know, it's already been, you know, looked to as brought back as modification, right? So if there's things aren't, or we're not happy with the current version, you know, I think that's something that either, you know, we look to if, if we're gonna approve with, you know, under the basis of coming back with different modifications. But again, there's not much changes to the version one to version two. Uh, but that being said, opening back up for questions and comments, I see Wendy has her hand up. Yeah, so so essentially, I mean, the, the question in the in the chat was, what is the implementation plan? You know, in, in terms of the answer that was given, you know, there's a week to week review from the ECG and then it's decided from there with with a number of factors. But that's not a plan that we can share with community. Right. I think community is looking for, you know, tell me what it is so that I can be prepared and you know what the options are moving forward and there has to be a balance i mean with information it you know in, in terms of those factors but also the the promotion of vaccines and making sure that we're offering after hours you know opportunities and and those walk-ins and you know i still get calls from people saying you know when can, how do i get vaccinated um where do i go i mean other than social media we need to do more of that. And we've talked about that in council, but making sure that that communication is very strong as well and creating those opportunities. So we have to make sure there's a balance if we're, if we're containing this still um, in, in all fairness. So um, anyhow, I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks, uh, thanks Wendy for your comments. Uh, Michelle. Thanks Chief. And so my question is, I know that there's groups putting forward their return to play all of their plans to ECG. So if an organization had put a plan in say two months ago and they were denied, do they have to resubmit or are you looking at those plans all the time? Thank you, uh, thank you, Michelle. I do see our chair on our ECG on the line who can speak to this as well, Mike. Good evening, everybody. Um, so yes, we, we have received a return to play plans from Six Nations Mind Lacrosse, Six Nations Girl Field Lacrosse, and uh, Iroquois Roots Rugby, which we are reviewing. And uh, we do maintain contact with those who have submitted prior uh, because it all is all contingent upon um, the framework as was presented and uh, the gathering sizes. So we are in constant contact with them. And there's also a uh, for those who don't know and who are watching at home, um, there's a event submission form. So if there's if there's vendors out there or service providers like the Red Barn um, who want to to get in touch with us in regards to you know running a camp and want to get in, in front of it, um, that form is available at Six Nations COVID19.ca for them to fill out and submit to us. And they're they're more than welcome to get in touch with me directly so that I can help guide them through the those those uh, processes. And as far as a implementation plan, I believe you touched on it earlier, Chief, in that. We are looking to move to orange uh, this week, pending council approval um, and pending ECG approval. So um, I guess uh, look for updates um, at the end of this week. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Mike. I see Lori. Lori, did you want to provide any further comment? Yeah, I just wanted to add in terms of the um, movement from one color the, to the next, there's a two week time frame. Um, so we, if we have uh, two weeks of low, uh, two consistent weeks of low with uh, a continued increase in vaccination, then the recommendation will come out to move to the next uh, lower level of uh, alert. Um, 
meaning that the restrictions are, are lessened. Um, that also gives a time um, to see if numbers are rising and be able to respond accordingly. So we don't want to move too quickly. Um, we don't want to make uh, make mistakes um, so that we're able to respond um, if if we do have another spike in cases. Um, but you know, we, we do want to acknowledge um, very strongly the the, the community's commitment to our public health measures um, and their commitment to um, you know. Uh, doing everything that they can to keep this virus in check. So, uh, you know, the, the, the work that was done uh, to, to create the, the 2.0 version of the response framework really looked at what have we learned over this last year um, and, and really, you know, on the advice of council, looking to try and make as much consistency as we could. So where we were uh, less restrictive because, our community of, because of our community compliance, we've maintained that. Um, and where we were more restrictive, we've uh, aligned ourselves uh, clo more closely with what the province is doing. So, you know, we really are looking at trying to uh, provide the community with an opportunity to to uh, get out and do those things that are good for their mental and physical well-being and, and get us, uh, you know, get us get back together again in a, in a safe way. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marie. Just really quickly, I do see a number of hands being raised and uh, speaker list going here. Uh, but just even prior to, uh, like, say, for example, the the version one, technically that would be on. So we do two weeks low risk, which we received. That's what got us from black to red, right? We're now getting into two weeks low risk, which would be this week, which could move us from red to orange. That's why I had mentioned that earlier because I think it was imperative if we can get to orange and maintain still the the importance of public health guidelines and all those pieces. That would suffice a lot of what we're seeing from our desk, our table. So from Helen's earlier co comments to day camps, to restaurants, to those pieces, I think it still, uh, you know, could have that consistency as we see Friday, June 11th, the province is shifting to stage one. So I think we were right in line with uh, where we go from this. So again, open up for discussion on that piece as well. I do see a number of hands being raised. I'm going to first begin with Helen, over to Nathan, uh, and then Audrey. Helen, you have the floor. Okay, I got a question from a community member and she wants to know why vaccination rates are being used to determine moving from one level to the next when vaccination is not mandatory. So the, the criteria is that we continue to see a 3% increase in the vaccinations in uh, the uptake of vaccinations in our community. You're correct, vaccinations are not mandatory, but the more people that we have vaccinated, the safer the entire community becomes. So it, it, instead of having a target that we have to have, you know, a certain number of people vaccinated, knowing that we have, you know, a community that, that uh, has some resistance to getting vaccinated, um, what we wanted to uh, build into the framework was that we see we see a consistent uh, continuation of, of up, uh, uptake in vaccines. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lori, for your response. And I'm sure we can have further discussion on that piece as well. Uh, Nathan. Yeah, thanks, Chief, and, and good discussion on this and, and good work on the, the hybrid model um, coming into this. But just to kind of help out with um, this discussion on the proposed implementation phase plan going out to community, I, I'm also wondering if it would be helpful um, as we um, are going into an area where uh, we're hopefully opening up more, we know the province is opening up more, um, and, and we have this kind of implementation plan so the community knows what's happening from one code to the other. But is it also uh, beneficial now, um, Chief, maybe to, to also look at what, that, what those tools are, almost like a toolkit for um, those businesses, those, those um, you know, community members that uh, are providing a service outside of SNEC um, to, to begin utilizing that so they know you know, what they have to prepare for and, and how they have to um, work with the community when they're in red and then moving to yellow, um, uh, those kind of things too. I think that's what uh, also they're referring to when they talk about an implementation plan uh, so that they have that awareness. So, you know, a toolkit, uh, you know, we could start with 
you know, the information that we have and, and just continue to build that as we go into recovery, because at the same time, we have to acknowledge this is first time we're in a pandemic. This is also the first time we're, we're getting ourselves out of a pandemic. So what is that preparation uh, also for community members, businesses and those providing the services? So just a suggestion um, as we uh, as we continue to work through the development of this. Thank you, uh, Nyal and Nathan, for the for your your comments and suggestion. I think that's great, and that's exactly what we've heard from our, our business Zoom sessions. Right? Is they just they would like notice. <laughs> They'd like to be a part of decision and notice to making these decisions as to what that means for their businesses. So I, you know, nonetheless, I think that's part of of IMT or ECG, ECG level work to then or then come up with what this potential toolkit or whichever we're going to refer to it looks like. Um, I think those are key pieces. And I think just in terms of Helen's question from community uh, in relation to vaccinations, I think another piece that we have to take into consideration, and this is exactly why we have decided to maintain our own framework and, and have our difference from the province, right? Is because, again, we've said loud and clear, you know, vaccinations are not mandatory, however, come highly recommended. However, we have a big area uh, of individuals who still uh, and look to and rely on their own traditional medicines and what they see best for themselves. You know, so I think that's something that we need to take into consideration because what happens in the sense that we don't get to 3% increase and we're stuck in that, in that current alert level for some time until we get to that 3%. So again, I, I don't know uh, how much that will uh, go for. I think that we need to really just, I don't, I don't think we necessarily need to even include those pieces just because the province is looking to reach a certain percentage in order to get to them to the level or stage one of their reopening doesn't mean that we necessarily have to do the same thing so i think this is exactly good conversation and, di and discussion uh, as we move forward uh audrey yeah, i just wanted to say that uh good work by the emergency control group and all the uh workers as well as it was a nice presentation very thorough sarah and i'd like to know what our next step steps are. Are we looking for a emotion on this for our going uh, accepting version two or are we doing it at information? And if it's a motion to accept then I will make a motion. So one, it was really for discussion and decision. So yes, we are looking for decision to, to accept version two. However, you know, just based on discussion, uh, there may be changes that, that need to be made after this discussion because I'm not getting a sense that everyone is entirely agreeing to the 3% in the vaccination. Uh, and I'm getting a sense that not everyone is entirely agreeing to all the indicators, but mind you, you know, we, we, those have been in place with version one. So again, there's not much changes from version one to version two. It's a matter of recognizing those pieces, which Nathan has alluded to in terms of the, the toolbox and how we then now uh, set out and give more notice to when we change alert levels and what that means for community and businesses. Wendy? Mark, yeah, can I be next, Melba? Sure, I have, I have Wendy and then Melba and then Michelle. Wendy, you have the floor. Yeah, so I, I agree with your point. I think we have to have some caution and, and maybe go back to some wording just in terms of the, the indications of, of what the decisions are based on because I, I agree there are a number of people who you know practice traditional medicine people have different beliefs and i think we have to respect that um so you know to to hold up a, a dish decision based on those numbers it's you know i certainly hear what's what's being said in, in terms of at the end of the day, we, we hope that people will get vaccinated, but if they don't because of their own beliefs, then, I mean, we can't do anything about that, right? We have to respect that moving forward. So I, I agree with maybe having some wording changes, but um, in terms of the decision-making, I mean, I'm prepared to make a motion to go to alert level orange effective Friday, and we can move ahead and we can start putting information out in terms of the planning for that and people can get prepared for it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Wendy. Just, it, just if I can ask if you could just hold on, on your motion for now, just while I go to the next two speakers, and then we'll start to get into next steps and decisions. Uh, I do have Melba next, uh, and then over to Michelle, and then I'll start to really move into next steps. Melba, you have the floor? Yes. Yes, similar to uh, um, Wendy's comments. Uh, 
I have had two calls uh, concerning traditional medicine, and that is why they don't get the vaccination. And I'm wondering if that can be considered. Will you call upon the people to tell to tell the ECG and public health and other officials, you know, that they are no long, longer getting the vaccination. They are using their traditional medicine. After all, supposedly, from time immemorial that we've had our medicines and it's here. It's all here for us. Everything we need from the creator. So will there be consideration that the ECG concerning traditional medicines included with the vaccinations thank you okay thank you uh thank you Malcolm, for your comments as well uh over to you uh michelle good points melbourne wendy i was actually going to motion what i motioned a couple of weeks ago to move to orange um but wendy has gone and made the motion okay so i do want to first first of all again if there's if there's areas or any further discussion around the hybrid framework but again, there, there is uh, really three recommendations that, that we need to look to for decisions if we're prepared to make a decision on the hybrid framework now, which is the version two that Sarah had just went through. Uh, in addition to that, I believe also to the motion looking to move to alert level orange, uh, as well as the previous recommendation for daycares. So those are really the three items uh, that I'd like to look to. So if there's anything further in relation to the hybrid framework, uh, I want to look to, again, having further uh, discussion and can maybe have come back uh, next week to council on the framework itself for version two, all while still, I believe we are following our end indicators to move to alert level orange. Uh, Helen? Yeah, if we, well, I just wondered if we move to alert level orange, is daycare going to have to redo their plan? Because their their plan is for the red. It's, it's actually through yellow through red, right? So it, it's all dependent through all, each color. So they would be okay, whether they're in orange or red. Oh, so okay. Technically, they can be open right now under red. All right. Yeah. Okay, council. So that being said, I, I will shift back then. It sounds like the, the most uh, pressing item right now to, that we could agree upon is moving alert level. Uh, so I'll look to, uh, I believe it was Wendy who put the motion forward to move from alert level red, decrease down to alert level orange, effective Friday, June 11th. Is there anything further that you'd like to add to your motion, Wendy? Only that we encourage community to become vaccinated. Um, if they want more information, we can provide more information. Um, young people can be vaccinated. So if just, you know, just to add that, as well at the end of it, just as that, that encouragement. Okay, perfect, thank you for that. Is there a seconder to the motion? Second by Michelle. Now opening up for any further questions or comments. Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motions carried. Motion to waive second reading. Moved by Wendy, seconder. Second by Michelle. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motions carried. Okay, so just a quick recap on that motion. We will be moving to alert level orange effective Friday, June 11th. So we'll be working with our comms team to get as much information and notice out uh, to community and businesses as soon as possible. The next motion I do want to go to really quickly, if I can, uh, is in relation to the actual framework itself. Do we have, is there any further questions or comments, or do you see any work uh, more related that needs to happen on the framework, or are we willing or looking to be able to pass the framework version two now? I think there still needs to be a couple pieces uh, back to the table and then brought back, but that's just from what, what I see. Questions, comments, Wendy? Yeah, I mean, I think there's extensive work that's been done, and, and I certainly recognize that and, and applaud all, all the um, people that, who have worked on it. But, but I think I'd be prepared to make a motion in principle, but I do agree that there are a couple of things that can be um, changed in terms of wording, just to address what Helen was talking about with the camps and, and other things about 
you know, traditional medicine and so on. Um, not huge changes, but something that should be in there and making sure that it's addressed. So that can come back next week. Um, you know, we'll, if we have it in principle, just to, to guide through, but, but work on those couple of components and it will just strengthen it going forward. Definitely. And thank you. Uh, thank you, Wendy, for your comments. So I will, if I can uh, just hold off, if that's okay with full council on any motion at this time, we've, I think, uh, with Mike on the line, our chair of ECG, as well as Sarah and Lori, uh, we have been given, uh, you know, signal in terms of what are some of those changes that could happen in the current version too. So we'll, we'll go back to the drawing board and look to the, again, not many changes. And again, great work has gone into this, this framework. And I think that's what makes us a lot uh, more unique as a community, as we're not following what the province is doing, we're doing what's best for our, our entire community. Uh, so I'll look to hold off and we can bring forward the hybrid framework for final approval, uh, either next week at general council or at the next council meeting, or we could be also calling a special council meeting. So I'll advise council in terms of next steps for there. The other piece I want to just touch base on is in relation to the recommendation from our uh, child care centers. Uh, so there was a, a recommendation, I believe, Shirley, you already have it on, on. Is that correct, Shirley? Can you just give me a thumbs up? Okay, so we're good there. Yvette, I think we're good on, on your piece as well, because technically, I, I don't even really think that with the motion that we just made, that we don't necessarily need to make that recommendation or pass that motion, because you would fall in line under the current orange, orange alert level. Uh, questions, comments? Wendy? So there was a there's a standing motion, right, where we said that daycares were closed um, under COVID. So do we have to rescind that motion so that daycare will now fall under the updated? It was just color alert. Yeah. yeah. So maybe what we could do uh, actually, <laughs> Wendy, is include a piece on the motion that we just passed. That way, it supersedes that motion. Uh, so technically, if we could just add in just a few, like a, a one sentence at the end of the motion that was passed, if that's okay with the mover and seconder, that this motion would supersede any motions prior to in relation to daycares. Okay. Is that okay with yourself and the seconder? Okay. And is that okay with, is there any opposition to, to full council to the, include those pieces? Okay, seeing or hearing it, so we'll include that surely in the motion that was just uh, passed in relation to moving to orange alert level. That being said, then Yvette in our list, uh, your recommendation uh, would be then null and void as you would then now fall under uh, what we just passed. So you would still be able to open as planned. Uh, Helen, question, comment? Oh, sorry, okay. So that being said, then, uh, I just want to thank each of you and again, continue to do all of uh, the good work. I know there's so much happening within this community. Uh, and again, just encourage, you know, for those uh, who would like to get vaccinated, it is there for you. We are now, now administering the Pfizer vaccines, uh, ages 12 to 17. After June 12th, uh, um, the arena location will be uh, closed and all appointments will be administered through our public health office. So that's, again, communication that will be going out to full community, just as an FYI. Uh, so we've, we've done our, our, our very best to have our mass clinic uh, and to get through as many people as we could uh, in the beginning on the onset when we first received the vaccines in March. So again, just want to applaud all the work uh, and teamwork that has been put into uh, the mass vaccination and now tra uh, transferring over to public health office after June 12th. So Further information and communication will be will be going out to community on just on that note as well. Wendy, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, will walk-ins be available and after hours because people are still working. So <laughs> if we want to make sure that we increase vaccinations, then we should be making it, uh, you know, the opportunity is as big as possible. Definitely. So can we build that in? I know we have no control over public health because they're federal, but I mean, if there's a way to manage that, I think it's would be optimal for the community. 100%, I see Lori Davis-Hill has put her screen on. Perhaps she may want to comment, Lori? Yeah, I just, uh, you know, I, I welcome the comments. Um, we have we have offered those times um, with very little uptake uh, in terms of evenings and, 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 and walk-ins have been available. So, um, you know, we can continue to look at uh, the availability of uh, the, the staff to offer those. Um, 
if you have particular people that you are aware of, or if, if there are community members uh, who can advise us of when the best times would be, then that would be really helpful. Um, if, you know, if, if it's a, you know, if it's a, if it's a certain day of the week or uh, on the weekends or you know something something more specific, um, because um, you know trying to be prepared for any time of day, any day of the week it is is a challenge, um, and when you know, to be prepared for that. So, so just just to follow up, I, I think it's like any other program, right? You just set it and people know. I think it's all in the communication. I mean, what I get is people get confused. Is it open? Is it not open? What day is it? You know, when is it available? I know that, you know, you all work very hard to, to do that, but there's still confusion. So if it's just a set schedule, every Thursday between five and eight, it will be an extended clinic every week. That's it. And then people know, and it becomes that routine and that regular process. And I think that's what people are looking for. Yeah, and I, I mean, I would, I would add, um, you know, we, we are obviously still missing people um, in our communication pathways. We've, we're doing social media, we're doing print ads, we're doing radio, um, and, and we're still missing people. So, you know, if there are any other suggestions that yourselves as, as elected council or community members have for, for ways to get the information out, um, we would really appreciate, uh, you know, um, some 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 suggestions. Thank you. Well, I wrote I wrote I sent in two two memos with a very <laughs> long list of suggestions and recommendations a couple of times. So I'll I'll defer to my colleagues further. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Wendy and Lori, for your comments. I, I am going to shift to next steps. I do recognize Sarah has her hand up. Sarah, Chief. Uh, maybe maybe you are going to discuss this further, but I just want to clarify to ensure that I have the rec the changes that are recommended from council. So what I'm hearing is we want to remove vaccine coverage from our criteria for reducing alert levels. And what I've also heard is that we would like uh, day camps to be open and read. Is there any recommendations that I'm missing uh, from council? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for, for asking for that clarification. Just looking at Council, is there anything further that Council would like to see in version two? Wendy? Just for clarity, I, I certainly, I, I didn't say anyway, removal of vaccines is, is one of those, those components, but it's recognizing that people look to traditional medicine as well. So what is the balance there and the consideration moving forward? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Sarah. Uh, I do want to shift just really quickly over to Carrie. Yeah, uh, you said the vaccines are moving to public health after the June, June the 12th. So all the, all the young ones that got a vaccine on Saturday, well, my girl, her next, her second one is June the 26th. And, and they said the same place. So is it still going to be there at the arena? Yeah, that will be the last day of the mass vaccination clinic um, operating at the arena. But first, first vaccinations have now moved to public health. So my girl can still go to the arena on June the 26th for her second shot? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Carrie and, and Lori. Uh, okay, Council, so moving forward then, uh, we have all motions and decisions made at this time. We will bring back forward the hybrid framework with the noted uh, changes forthcoming uh, and get that passed for version two. Is there any further questions or comments? Okay, that being said, again, just wanna thank each of you for joining us this evening uh, and providing the presentation. Uh, and update to community. So get just a quick recap. As of Friday at 12.01 in alignment with the province, we will be a moving to alert level orange here in Six Nations. So communication will be going out and we will get notice out to businesses and full community uh, as soon as possible. Um, okay, that being said, we'll shift now into, uh, unfortunately, we don't have the general council minutes of May 25th. Uh, those are still being prepared. 
Uh, we will bring those items back forward at the next council meeting. So we'll have two items of minutes to pass during then. So we'll move right into recommendations from the ethics committee. And I'm going to ask if I can just really quickly, uh, Councillor Michelle to take over as chair as I step out and, and rejoin the meeting. Yep, okay. Okay, thank Thanks. you so much. And so let's carry on to item number six. We have four recommend or five recommendations. And so we're going to need a mover and a seconder. So the first recommendation is in regards to Sarah Smith, who just presented in her study with McMaster on COVID community study. Do I have, Audrey, do you want to move? Yes. Please. Do I have a seconder? I'll second it, Melba. Okay. We have Audrey moving, Melba seconding. Any questions? Everybody should see the, the summaries in their Dropbox. Hearing no questions, all in favor? Favor. Does anybody oppose? Motion is carried. Recommendation number two. Um, this is in regards to Tony Johnson. And there was some discussion in regards to this because it is a program evaluation um, under the Tri-Council policy. When you're doing program evaluation, you don't need ethics approval, but uh, the Justice Department as well as McMaster wanted to bring it forward to our ethics committee. Do I have a mover? I'll move, it's Melba. Thanks, Melba. Do I have a seconder? I'll second it, Nathan. Okay, do I have questions? Hearing no questions, all in favor? Does anybody oppose? Motion is carried. Moving along to recommendation number three in regards to Ms. Everett's application with regards to fire services. And looking Michelle, at I just have one question to go. Can we go back to that one? I just have a question. Sure. I'm just questioning why ethics, why, if it's evaluating the victim services program, is that our victim services program or all indigenous victim services programs? It is the Six Nations Victim Services Program. So why is an evaluation of one of our programs going through ethics and going to be done by um, Tani Johnson? Doesn't Can I add go, something, Michelle? Wouldn't that all go through administration and the SAO and everything? And, and I believe it. it just did. And as I indicated, um, evaluation typically doesn't come forward to ethics. Um, Lori, did you want to add to it? Yeah, we did have a, a, a bit of a conversation about um, the program evaluation may um, be uh, triggering to some of the community members who have been involved in Indigenous Victim Services. So they wanted to make sure that the ethics uh, committee had reviewed the questions and the research um, and, and fully understood that there, there were uh, um, processes in place to address that uh, um, if there was any impact. Okay, thanks, Lori. Go ahead, Councillor Johnson. So where is it coming from? Where is it being initiated from? Like, because victim services, I mean, that goes back to Meg and it's like, you've got, Helen's right, like it's under a program. So where is this being initiated from? Just... Um, I, I will say, well, I want to look at the notes. Can we defer that one? And Shirley, are you on? Who's or or Darren, can Darren shed some light on it if it's administration or? I don't have an issue with it, but it just seems like it's not, it's not following um, normal process. Yeah, it's a funny process. Would, I would Strange. support deferring it because I need to investigate a little bit further. I don't have as, enough information to provide a comment. Okay. And yeah, there was discussion as Lori, Nathan. Nathan, I don't know if you want to share or even Melba in regards to the discussions that were had at ethics, but um, it was something we discussed at length that our program evaluation shouldn't be coming to ethics. It's, it's Nathan here too. I, I, I thought it was a little wonky in terms of looking at it, but once we dove into the reasons and the rationale, I did see, I saw both sides. 
uh, in terms of providing that balance. But um, definitely, if uh, if Darren needs more time to do the investigation, let's let's defer this because I thought we talked about you know looping back in with admin and, and ensuring those uh, pieces were done. And I'm hearing that that wasn't done, so uh, I'm in favor of deferring. Thank you, Nathan. We will defer recommendation number two. And thanks, Helen, Wendy. Um, now moving on to recommendation three in regards to fire services. Um, this is Brantford Fire Services, their commitment to the TRC. Do I have somebody willing to move this research? I'll move, it's Melba. Moved by Melba, then I have Helen seconding. Do I have questions? Okay, all in favor? Do I have anybody opposed? Hearing none, motion is carried. Recommendation number four. This is Six Nations Polytechnic under Stevie Jonathan. We'll be exploring food sovereignty. Moved by Councillor Paulus Spomberry. Do I have a seconder? I'll second, Nathan. Moved by Councillor Wright. Any questions? Wendy? Wendy, you're on mute. Sorry, I'm going to declare a conflict on this one. Thank you. Councillor Johnson declares her conflict. Any questions? Hearing none. All in favor? Any councillor opposed? Motion is carried. And we have the one declaration of conflict. And the final recommendation is number five. And this is in regards to Santi Smith's research with her dance company um, in partnership with McMaster as well as uh, Ryerson University. Do I have a mover in regards to this? Thank you, Audrey. A seconder? Melba. Thanks, Melba. Any questions? All in favor? Anybody opposed? Hearing none, motion is carried. Okay, let's move right along to section number seven, the recommendations from the Human Services Committee. Oh, second reading. Wave second. I will. I will wave second reading, Melba. Oh, second. Um. Okay. So moved by Melba, second by Audrey. Waving second reading on one, two. No, sorry. One, three, four, five. All in favor? Does anybody oppose? Hearing none. Motion is carried. Okay, Wendy, did you have a question before we go into section seven? Uh, I did. So just to declare a conflict on the second reading of that as well, just so it's noted in the minutes. And, and just a, I don't know if it's a point of order, but with everything that comes through from ethics, normally isn't the mover and seconder present for this? Um, so generally they are, um, but yeah, they're not. Well, I guess Arliss was on the line. Sorry, Arliss, I didn't see you. Um, but I guess that's where we need clarification because last time it was counselors who had to move in second. I, it, and that's my point because every time something comes through from ethics, counselors have to make the motion. So it doesn't follow the recommendations coming through. Um, so just, I just, I don't know what the process is. So um, that, that's, we don't need to, I don't need to get into a big <laughs> discussion on it, but it, it is different than what we follow for other motions. Yeah. And I mean, there's three counselors there if they're all there, right? And so we do use committee to move forward because we do have quorum when we have committee, not necessarily all the counselors can be there. Okay, thanks Wendy. So let's move right along um, to the Human Services Committee recommendations. 
So Audrey, over to you. I move that the human services committee recommends the six nations of the Grand River elected council to support a six nations community bid committee to form a partnership with the city of Hamilton for the preparation of the 2030 Commonwealth Games bid. And if the bid is successful, the six nations of the Grand River elected council will make an in-kind donation by permitting the use of the six nations parks and recreation facilities. And Hazel, you still second? Do I have a seconder? Anybody? So here I'm second it. It's Melba. Okay, thanks, Melba. So at this point, is there any questions in regards to the motion that Audrey just read? Nathan, and then Wendy. Yeah, I have no problem with the motion. I'm just wondering um, between now and, and 2030, um, should we look at business opportunities, opportunities for in infrastructure in a community? Um, and and um, jobs, um, job creation. Um, if if we're looking at 2030 for the Commonwealth Games, I also understand lacrosse is part of that. Is there infrastructure needs that we need to do for the lacrosse field, um, stands, stuff like that? Um, but I know this is just the starting point. I'm kind of I might be jumping ahead of myself, but. Um, I, I also think 2030 is a long way away, but it's also in terms of some of those big projects, it's it's not much time. So I'm just putting that out there for council's consideration and thinking, but uh, in, in support of the motion. Thanks, Nathan. Wendy? Yeah, I, I just, um, when I was reading the briefing note, I mean, it, it centered quite a bit around the former chief. Um, I, I'm not opposed to the motion. But just in terms of what are we on the hook for going forward with being a partner on that in that bid? I mean, I see the in-kind contribution of parks and recs, but beyond that, is there anything else that we should be aware of? I guess I look to the mover and seconder for that. Is that a question? Hold on. So Wendy has a question first. Audrey, Melba, do you have anything further that you can answer? I just answered, Michelle. Oh, sorry, Mel Audrey, you were on mute. I said, I don't know any further details than what we have here in front of us. Okay. And then Melba? No, I don't have any more either other than what we have. Okay. Thank should you, we, ladies. Should so, we find out? <laughs> I was just going to re recommend that we defer and bring this back so, next month. I, I think um, a month is okay. Is okay. council, Helen, I'll come to you next. Is council good with that? I have a question. Okay, go ahead, Helen. Uh, my question is who brought it to committee? Who brought it up at, somebody had to have brought it to committee. Who brought it there? It was brought by Cheryl Henhock from Parks and Rec. Oh, She's okay. On the committee and the chief is also involved as well. Is this one of, this is like, we, we involved ourselves in a couple of games last time. I'm not sure if this is the one where we, I'm not sure if this is the one, because I remember one time that our vendors weren't treated well. <laughs> Way back in a corner where nobody saw them. I don't know if it was a Commonwealth Games or those other things. So yeah, I agree with Nathan. Um, we need to look at all different things and see if there's any kind of benefit can come to Six Nations other than just sharing our facilities. Normally when people put in bids to be partnerships on games like this, they get all kinds of infrastructure put in place that they need. So we may be able to see some use here. 
get something okay. for something. So I hear there, <laughs> thanks, Helen. There is work to be done. So what I'm going to suggest is defer it, take it back to committee or, or um, Cheryl and provide that additional information. The proposal is due February 2022. So hopefully within the summertime, we can get that information and um, that be brought back to full council. Is everybody okay with that? Okay, I, I see. That's fine. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you, Melba. Okay, let's move to, to number seven, recommendation two. Hazel, are you there? Yeah. I move that the Six Nations Human Services Committee recommend to the Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council to approve Human Services Committee Health Services Manual and adopt it as part of the Human Services Committee Members Orientation Package. Second, Melba. Okay, so I have it moved and seconded. Any comments? I have a couple. Uh, when? Uh, so, sorry. So just in terms, I'm, I'm not clear on what the purpose is because I think when I started reading it, I, I got the, the orientation piece of it, but then it gets into the foundational legal documents and the bylaws and it goes into um, the Six Nations Elected Council procedural regulations. So we're, we're turning a corner here and getting into something else. So I don't know what the regulations are under the Human Service Services Committee um, because it goes in a couple of different directions. And when it gets into the political structure, it talks about transition. So I don't know if it's health um, or transformation. So I'm not, I'm not sure where it's going. Um, are we talking about health transformation in terms of the looking ahead? And are we approving that as part of the orientation or it, it's just, I, I certainly see the foundation for it, but I think it needs some more clarity in terms of its purpose and what it's saying. But okay. I'm, the regulations are new to me. Thanks, Wendy and Lori, can you respond? Please. Yeah, so uh, we are uh, facing our accreditation um, uh, survey cycle for health services uh, next week. And part of the accreditation standards was that there is an orientation to uh, the structure that functions as our governance, which is human services committee and um, as, as a, as a um, uh, as their role as part of elected council. So uh, this is something that we put together to meet those accreditation standards. And those were uh, headings that were in a recommended version of an orientation manual. The, um, there is a, a requirement to talk about the governance structure. And those documents that were inserted in there are the only documents that I could find ex in existence that guide uh, Six Nations Elected Council operations. So those are council documents that are just cut, uh, just sort of uh, uh, cut um, the, 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 the titles of those documents uh, to insert into the manual. So it's a, it's a framework um, and the mention of health transformation um, is part of just a, a, an update on what's been happening in health services and was previously included in the orientation to the 58th elective council. So, you know, all of that information has been presented to council in the past and it's a, it's a, it's a booklet that um, just provides a framework and will be updated uh, as, as we move forward on a regular basis so that anyone stepping into the human services committee um, we'll have uh, something to work from. Thanks, Lori. Um, I, actually, Wendy, do you have a, a comment? And then... Uh... Yeah, yeah, and I, I guess that's kind of how I'm reading it because it's, it's taking pieces and kind of putting it in, but it doesn't necessarily flow or, or fit. I guess that's what I'm, I'm saying, but I, I understand you, you put in what, what you could access. Um, my only concern is once we pass it, and it sounds like you need it next week, um, once we pass it, it's, it's a done deal, right? Then this is in play. 
Um, it is it is a living document, um, and it does say that at the very back of the of the document, um, so that it it should be modified and and updated and. You know, it, it, it is a, a template that um, you may want to consider for other committees under council, um, and I'm I'm happy to revise it and update it uh, according to council's um, procedures and policies to make sure that it's re it's truly reflective of of our of our uh, governance. Thanks, Lori. Thanks, Wendy, for the question. Yeah, so you've answered my comments because the information in there is for. The 57th council right and some of our and the committees are not correct but you're saying that's the only information you could get a hand handle on so um you've included that so hopefully if it's possible <laughs> you could get the updated versions um because it talks about 13 councillors and districts and we don't do that yeah and that that that's the only documentation that i could find on the um available i did reach out to uh, the SAO and our director of policy, um, and, and that was what I had to work with. So, Darren, is it possible to provide the updated information so that yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and uh, Laurie did share it with me, and and as well, Dwayne, and just for so our councils aware, we have been working on updating all of the committee uh, and and the, the, re the regulations in terms of, of operations under council, where all those corrections have been made. Um, if, you, if you recall, that that work had been yet to be completed, but it's very close to being completed. So we did take that as a cue that, that perhaps we could look at this manual for all committees and up and do an update for everyone, for all committees. Okay. Wayne is working on that as we speak. Well, maybe not right now, but. <laughs> thank you. And so hopefully, yeah, Lori has that before she has to submit. So thank you. We have um, Hazel moving, second by Melba. All in favor? Anybody oppose? Hearing no opposition, motion is carried. Okay, let's move to recommendation number three. Melba? Yes, so I'll move uh, um, that the Six Nations uh, Human Services Committee recommends that the Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council accept the name change of the Continuous Quality Improvement Committee to the We Will Do Things Well quality committee and the updated terms of reference as information and there's a Indian word there and maybe Lori can say it. Sorry, hey. Esadakis. Esadakis. Thank you. I still move. Do I have a seconder? I second. Thank you. Questions? Hearing no questions, all in favor? Does anybody oppose? Motion is carried. Moving to number recommendation four. I move that the Six Nations Human Services Committee recommends to the Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council to authorize the senior administrative office, the SAO, to sign Schedule E form of compliance declaration issued pursuant to multi-sector services accountability agreement between the Hamilton Niagara Haldeman Brandt Local Health Integration Network, HNHBLHIN, and the health services provider HSP, applicable period April 1st, 2020, to March 31st, 2021. I move. Moved by Hazel Melba, I think was seconded. Uh, Audrey, if she's available. I'm oh, sorry. Is she not available? <laughs> yes, I seconded. Okay. So my question is, Darren, you can sign these, correct? So is this not in MIN? Can I respond? Go ahead, Laurie. Uh, yes, it is. It, it is an administrative activity. However, uh, part of the agreement also indicates that there needs to be a council resolution in support of the signature being provided. Thank you, Laurie. So that's why it is at this table. Okay. Do I have other questions? 
Hearing none, all in favor? Favor. Does anybody oppose? Hearing no opposition, motion is carried. And recommendation Michelle? number five. Go ahead, Melba. Michelle, did you want a uh, waiving of second reading on three and four? Would we do them all we together? Didn't. Or do we have to do them all separately? We still have a recommendation number five, and I was thinking to do them all. Okay. After recommendation number five. Yep. After so five. Just a just a typo there. Audrey's Paulus Bomber needs to be added in that motion. Okay. Um, before we go on to recommendation five, I see Wendy, and then I heard Darren. So go ahead, Wendy. Yeah, just on number five and just Lori, is there a requirement for a motion for this as well? Because this just sounds like, you know, you're using the ban for to extend it to twice a week. I mean, that's administrative it, to me. <laughs> the, the reason it's here in front of council is that the van is provided by Alderman Norfolk and Brandt. So it's a service that lives off reserve and would be coming onto the territory twice a week to meet the needs of our community members. So it was for making sure that council is aware that this is a, a van that's not provided by Six Nations Health Services at this time uh, as an interim measure. Um, and hopefully it'll be something that we can develop um, uh, to be able to provide ourselves in the future. Yeah, I, I mean, I certainly appreciate the, the update, but I, I don't think it requires a motion. I mean, that's just under your directorship. Okay. So thank you, Lori. Thank you, Wendy. And I see Helen before we go to more discussion. Yeah, Lori, I think if it's not if it's when I if it's not from Six Nations, anybody reading it is gonna think it's Six Nations then. So I would put that in there. But it's Haldem and Norfolk. Well, whatever you said it was. Harm reduction van. Yeah, it's the it's specified in the briefing note, and I'm sorry I don't have the the complete title. Oh, but yeah, I would I would agree that it should that it that it should specify. I mean, I'm, I'm not yeah. sure if you're going to to continue on with the motion or if it, you want to turn it back to administration. But um, it, it is to make sure that council is aware that it is not like it is an external um, service that is coming onto the territory. As you know, people are going to be asking us, what's a, what's that van doing driving around here? It's got Haldeman North or whatever sign on the door. Yeah. So yeah. Okay, so I have, thanks, Helen. Hey, uh, Audrey. I agree. I think it should, we should go ahead with the motion because we're basic, basically, as the council of governance, we're giving the authority for an outside entity to come onto the reserve. Yes, I agree. Uh, Melba. Melba, and then Wendy. Yeah, I think that's important too. It's my understanding that our our people will not be servicing this harm reduction van and possibly uh, uh, the media should certainly explain that possibly with a picture and uh, maybe even a picture of the of the people who would be possibly servicing the van that way they'll know because uh, they can get pretty rowdy sometimes our people what are you doing here for example so very important to um, have it come through council and the community know it's my understanding, though, it, it will be staffed by health. It's a partnership. So it, it's not fully staffed by Six Nations Health Services, but our our members will be um, engaging with the team that does it so that we can um, build capacity and uh, and relationships. OK, so council, we will vote on it. All in favor, or any more questions in regards to the, to the motion? Hearing none, all in favor? Favor. Favor. Anybody opposed? Hearing none, motion is carried. Now looking back to wave second reading for recommendations one through five. I'll move, Melba. Move by Melba okay. and I have a seconder, Audrey. All in favor? Motion is carried. Thank you, Lori, for being with us this evening. 
I, I'm not sure if you have anything in, in camera. I don't think so. So have yourself a, a good evening. Yeah, everyone take care. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, number eight, scheduling. So for the community, as you can see on the calendar, um, tomorrow we have building and infrastructure at 9 a.m. Uh, the 10th and the 11th is budget days for full council. Um, followed by next week, we have corporate and emergency services. And then general council, again, two weeks from today at 6 p.m., followed by our environment committee meeting. And then political liaison closes off our month of meetings. Um, so th those will be the Mondays and the Tuesdays will be um, live streamed. Political updates. I do not have anything. I was hoping the chief would be back on by this time to provide those updates. Um, so I will defer that into our next meeting. So at this time, I don't believe we had any additions to the agenda. So I need someone to adjourn our meeting so we can go into in-camera. Moved by Councillor Miller and seconded by Councillor Bomberry. All in favor? Motion is carried. I'd like to thank the community for um, you know, listening to us this evening and we will see you again in two weeks time. Take care, everybody.